Hi everyone, I'm Ian Kerr, many of you would know me as the host of the Postal Hub podcast and of course I'm one half of The Last Mile Profits and my co-host on The Last Mile Profits will be joining me along with Mike Richmond from Doddle in just a moment. Well, I guess it's now time for me to properly introduce my co-panellists today. Uh, I have Marek Rzetsky with me. Marek is the managing partner of Last Mile Experts and, of course, my partner on The Last Mile Profits video series. Hello, Marek. Hello, Ian. Have, hello, everybody. And of course, we've got Mike Richmond there. Mike is the Chief Revenue Officer at Doddle and one of the biggest brains on planet Earth when it comes to Pluto. <laughs> and by the way, Mike is in the office on his own today. So if we see anything behind him, we have to let him know. Right. The lights, yeah, the lights will definitely go off in about 20 minutes. They're on some motion sensors. So excuse me. They'll be okay well, in this room. Um, <laughs> and hopefully the fire alarm's not going to go off again. It went off 20 minutes ago while Mike was in there, but he didn't evacuate. Such is his dedication to the cause. So uh, great to have so many on the this Zoom webinar for this uh, special event today. Unless Mark or Mike, you have any opening comments, shall we just get stuck straight into it? Cool. I think it's a good idea. There we go. That's it. They're saying we'll get stuck straight into it. So um, we might start off, Marek, with this amazing statistic here that you've got from your own research. Would you like to go into this and explain, first of all, what we mean by out-of-home delivery, What this? Well, what's fueling this growth in out-of-home delivery in Europe? Out-of-home basically is PUDOs or for our American audience access points or lockers. So all the channels by which you deliver a parcel without delivering it physically to someone's doorstep. Um, and th the reason that I'm really excited about this is the first time Last Mile Experts has done a big piece of research in this space, basically looking at 28 countries in detail, over 42 interviews, uh, probably a 400 or so sites we visited and reviewed. Uh, and over 200 networks that we've looked at in detail. And, you know, the, the big highlight is that PUDOs and lockers are growing fast at, uh, at over 40%. And in fact, there are some places, we'll talk about Poland later, but Poland is the place where they're growing even faster. So we're, we're really excited about what's happening. And without a doubt, PUDOs and lockers are going to change the face of the last mile. What makes you say that, Marek? Well, I think if you look at what's happening so far, you look at the rate of change and actually, I don't know, Mike, what your take on this is, but if I were to choose one single thing, it's it's all about capacity. You cannot continue to deliver these huge volumes of parcels without finding more efficient ways of doing it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, efficiency is a huge part of it. And I think you know, we'll touch on some of that stuff later in some of the findings of our research, but um, we're at a place today where e-commerce is still growing. 10 or 15% a year. So you've got this kind of this, this drive for revenue growth and not really a focus on efficiency and profitability. And I think as markets mature and revenue growth slows, you'll start to see a drive for efficiency uh, and at a home offers some huge benefits in that respect. Let's move on then to some more research from Maddox team at Last Mile Experts. Maddox, shall we start with the pie chart? there um, which shows how out of home is divvied up can you just explain what's there in that pie chart please well basically it's the split between uh, lockers i.e the automated version and pudos which are the manual version and we can see that probably not surprisingly uh, there are far more pudos uh, if, if I were to, to draw some conclusions, and again, I think it would be great to have a bit of a debate with Mike on this one, but, but although we talk about lockers a lot, they're very sexy, the Impost IPO helped a little bit recently, but everything is, is it's all about lockers. But the reality is there are probably something like nine times more PUDOs in Europe. And when, we, when yeah. we talk about the 28 countries, it's of course the 27 EU markets plus the United Kingdom. Come on, Mike, I can see you're desperate to, to make a comment here. Don't, don't. It's uh, the biggest shooting yourself foot incident in the history of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and I was surprised when you shared this, Marek, with us before this webinar, that it was the, the, the APM number comparative to the PUDA number was so low, uh, you know, 12%. 
But as I think about it, you know, there are markets where Pudos have you know, been part of the delivery landscape since you know for the last 15, 20 years, like France, where the carriers use Pudos and have used Pudos. And that's why the out of home delivery kind of behavior is so well established in France. Um, but if you think forward, and like uh, one of the things that we've been debating a lot ourselves, and I'd love your view on is you know, how does this change? So five years out or 10 years out, what, is the, what does the pie chart look like in terms of lockers versus Pudos? And, and our, our view is actually in the short term, that pink segment is going to get smaller. So despite the noise around InPost and Instabox fundraising and Swipbox in the Nordics, all doing great things, you know, Pudos gives such speed to scale. So last year, DPD say they want to go from 2,500 Pudos in the UK to 7,000 Pudos. They can do that through deployment of an application through partnerships with major brands. Lockers, four and a half thousand Pudos at 14,000 euros a, a locker, you know, that's a huge capital expense. So Pudos give you scale, give you ability to roll out quickly. And that there's something about them being a change agent. They can drive the behavior shift, which drives the volume, which then enables the cost economics. Because the challenge of putting a locker in when you get two or three parcels is someone in the, in the finance team is saying, hold on, I'm not getting my payback on this. And so I think the Pudos in the short term will drive that pink segment even smaller as a proportion of, of the overall Pudo out of home market. But in the long term, I think you'll start to see, you know, the, the pink segment certainly taking up a quarter, if not maybe 40% of all out, uh, out of home networks and, and particularly in around urban deliveries. I see urban areas like London, you know, there aren't that many places that are a good Pudo. And so the, there is such an opportunity for someone to put 5,000 lockers in London. No one's quite found the way to do it yet. No one's found the capital to do it yet. But I think there's a, there's a massive opportunity there for, for uh, APMs or, or lockers in, in urban areas. We're going to dive into a couple of countries in just a moment, um, Mark. But if, we've already had questions coming in on the chat. The figure there of 333,600 PUDOs, does that include post offices in those networks? It includes, it includes all the major networks where uh, where they are generally accessible as access points. So there you go to the two people in the chat who asked that. So um, now, Marek, we might just dive into a couple of the different markets. Why don't we start with Poland, since Poland has been in the news lately, thanks to a certain IPO that we may have mentioned already. Uh, Marek, what is happening there in Poland? What's sort of driving those changes in the Polish market? Uh, Infos is happening actually recently. Uh, I think that there are actually, to be fair, we should talk about two things that have affected each other. So just before Infos, we had the Allegro IPO. And for those of you who don't know Allegro, it's Polish eBay, uh, the biggest marketplace in Poland. And there was a very, very successful IPO, which basically put e-commerce uh, on, should we say, uh, on the agenda. And then shortly after that in post. So it's really created an awful lot of noise in this space. Uh, the noise is warranted because although Poland is not the biggest country in Europe, it's, it's about half, in fact, less than half the size of Germany. As you can see, it's got the largest number of machines in Europe. Um, what is interesting, though, is although we are a very strong locker market, there are still almost 30,000 Pudos as well. So I think the, the, the key thing is Poland is moving to out of home. Uh, the other interesting information, it's the first place in Europe, at least, where I've heard that on a net promoter score, lockers scored higher than home delivery. So it's interesting. So it's interesting in that it, it bucks the trend, as it were, in that it is the number one locker market. It's growing very so fast. So just on that, Marek, just on that, Marek, I think the guys at Post Nord, I'll challenge you on that. The guys at Post Nord, there's a lady called Katy Pakalen, who I've never met, but I've, I've connected with on LinkedIn. And she put something really interesting on um, LinkedIn late last year, which showed that the customer satisfaction score for home delivery was lower than the customer satisfaction score for Pudos across 100,000 plus orders into both. It's not NPS, it's, it's customer satisfaction. It's their own internal rating. But like that as a message. I find really hard in my job talking to posts in markets like the UK or Australia to ever convince a postal operator or a carrier what, that some consumer may have a higher satisfaction rating in Pudo than they do home delivery. Those markets are so skewed towards home delivery that they can't believe it. But, you know, it does happen. Poland, Nordics, it's definitely starting to happen. 
The only thing I'd mention, Mike, with Nordics is Nordics are very special. Home delivery is very difficult. And it could be a little bit to do with the fact that, particularly up in the north of Sweden, um, it's really hard to do the home delivery. So probably it's it's a very specific use case. And price, of course, yeah. So if you if you add that you to the more. basket, it becomes challenging, yeah. Well, Mike, perhaps now we'll turn our attention to the UK. Uh, would you like to share some of the background to, to this? Because the UK is a very different market as well in terms of who has market share, who has partnerships and things like that. So can you just share some of the, the factors behind the figures there um, in for the UK? Yeah, so, well, this is this is Marek's report, not mine, uh, but I definitely helped uh, with some of the insight towards, I think, Marek. Um, yeah, I mean, the UK is different to most European markets in that there are probably eight or nine major Pudo networks of over a thousand locations because there are eight or nine major carriers, Royal Mail, Yodel, DPD, Hermes, DHL Parcel, like the UPS. There's lots of big carriers who've all historically established their own networks. So that 38, and, and a lot of them were established as Pudos. Um, the 7,000 lockers is Amazon Hub, and then is a mix of InPost, who I think have about 1,500 and some buy box locations. Um, but the kind of the two things that are happening in terms of change in the UK at the moment um, that I think are quite interesting are one, the networks are opening up. So big news late last year was the post office. So the post office in the UK we have this slightly odd structure where the post office is separate from the national carrier Royal Mail. Those are two separate entities, but the post office negotiated an agreement with Royal Mail where they can take parcels from any carrier. So that's 11,000 locations at the heart of every community that can suddenly take DPD, Amazon and Yodel parcels, as well as those from Royal Mail. And that kind of open behavior, which has also happened with Collect Plus and DPD, you know, those guys would have been rivals a few years ago, but are now cooperating on a network basis. That's that's definitely showing a change in mindset from a Pudo perspective that the networks might be open to being more open. The other big change in the UK in the last probably 18 months has been Amazon. So Amazon grew their network of maybe 5,000 lockers quite slowly over the course of, of the last 12 years. It's It's been slow because it's hard to, to grow a locker network unless you live in China. But you know they've got to do planning and they've got to do cost and they've got to do power and data. And that's been some of the challenges they've had. About, you know, and, and Amazon's Pudo strategy in the UK was to partner. So they partnered with Doddle, they partnered with Paypoint, they partnered with a few others. Um, and then about 18 months ago, that all changed and Amazon do what they do best. And they kind of, they work with partners and all of a sudden they want to do this themselves. They develop their own Pudo app, which looks a lot like other applications that may have been used. Uh, and then they, and then they roll out Amazon hub counter. So Amazon hub is the master brand. They've got Amazon locker and Amazon counter as the two sub brands counter is their Pudo. And in 18 months, you know, they have partnered with eight of the biggest brands in in the uk so post office are one of their partners already they work with co-op john lewis next paypoint uh m and co oh, there's a few others in there i post on linkedin about the weekend but the, the network of partners they work with gives them access to fifty thousand pudos so it's taken them eight years to get five thousand lockers it's taken them 18 months to get access to fifty thousand locations i'm not saying they have it's difficult to tell how many they have but i would estimate they have probably 8,000 Pudos, maybe even 10,000 Pudos already in the UK. And that's core to their strategy. Amazon are pushing Amazon Hub as a huge part of their delivery proposition. Now, we well, just mentioned is- on this slide, we've just highlighted four different markets. A number of people in the chat have been asking about other markets. So these are just four that we've highlighted. Mark, you, you were, are you about to say something? I cut you off. Can you just say that? And then I'd like you to just really briefly give us a couple of highlights about France because we've already had a question from Alexis asking about the um, locker number in France. So just finish your thought and then go to France, please. So very briefly, I think I think I was just going to confirm what Mike said earlier, that the beauty of Pudos is it's so quick and easy to develop them. And that's why um, it could well be there in the short term because of that that efficacy that, that we'll end up seeing a lot of Pudos, which will transform into lockers uh, over time as the demand is shown. Uh, there's two I'd like to talk about. We can start with France. France is interesting for me because uh, you'd have thought it's, it's a developed market. Why are there so relatively few lockers? And the lockers mainly are former near post, now Quadient lockers uh, used together with La Poste and a few others, but there really aren't very many for that size of market. Probably for two reasons. Number one, as you can see, given the population, there's almost 50,000 Pudo points or point relais, as, uh, as the French call them. 
uh, which is a pretty good result. But also France on B2C is dominated by La Poste and La Poste Group to a large degree decides what's happening. And La Poste has, has basically said, OK, it's, it's in the Pudo world. Things are going to be happening. And then the final two things, the potential alternatives, which are Amazon, have not developed that many lockers. To be fair, that 1,000, if there's any place where that could be a little bit understated, it's if Amazon has significantly more than a few hundred. Um, but other than them, the, the other player that could have made an impact was InPost, and it didn't work for reasons we can discuss uh, you know, in another meeting. Uh, I don't know, Mike, is there, is there anything from your side you, you want to add on, on the French picture that you think I've missed? No, no I think that's bang on. I mean, my. My understanding of the French market is those carriers have established point relay, you know, very early on in the infrastructure. They are very well accepted. And the key thing is that delivery to Pudo in France is 20 to 25 percent cheaper than a home delivery. That doesn't happen in all markets. You know, so so that's driven the behavior in, in you know, and whether that cost, which is charged to the merchant, is then passed on to the consumer and incentivizing the consumer, it's you know, is, is a is a merchant by merchant question. But you know, they've established a, a kind of a principle that B two B or Pudo delivery is cheaper than home delivery. Which interestingly, it's exactly the same figure as you have in Poland, around about 20, 25 percent difference. But let's move on to Germany. Let's, yeah, let's move on to Germany, because this is really interesting. For those of you who don't know, uh, Germany, and in particular Deutsche Post, is the father of locker technology in the sense that the processes behind it were developed and actually patented by Deutsche Post about 20 years ago. And I find it really incredible that, that given the fact that these guys were so early, that actually a country double the size of Poland has got just over half the number of lockers. We had a bit of a debate. You, you made a good point there, Mike, why, why that could be. We call it first mover disadvantage, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, no, it, it, I think it was Ian who was, who was challenging some of that at that point, actually. It was actually me, oh, but there you go, Mike and I, we, we look so similar. <laughs> I, can, I can understand how people would make, the, make that mistake. But just really quickly Seamless. on Deutsche Post, we've mentioned many times that Deutsche Post and Deutsche Post DHL were you know, the pioneers in parcel lockers. Uh, and the process that, and Marek has made this point many times, the process for signing up for a locker back 20 years ago was a lot more convoluted than it might be today. Uh, and they did a lot of learning, probably that the rest of the industry benefited from. So others have been able to learn from Deutsche Post's mistakes. Then you also look at the fact that you've got a very well-developed post office and Pudo network in uh, in Germany run by Deutsche Post. That's, that's separate from any other Pudo network that might be out there. And, of course, we don't understand you know, what the internal machinations may have been, whether there was pushback from industry stakeholders, uh, i.e. perhaps the unions might have been unhappy in the first instance about potentially losing jobs to machines for their for their parcel delivery of people. But I don't think that's an issue these days. <laughs> We're all just struggling to keep up with, with the parcel volumes. Um, look, we've had quite a few comments in the chat as well. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get through every single one of them. Um, but there was a good question there from Nick Bond. Hello, Nick, which is about what, what of these markets are open versus carrier specific. Just Mike, do you want to make a couple of quick comments about the situation in the UK? Because I know we've got plenty more content to get through. It's it's a good question with regard to yeah. the carrier specific situation in Pudos. So so UK historically almost all carrier specific. Uh, Doddle was an open access network. There was a few others who are who are open access. There's more open access happening. Now when you get into the details, open access can be a couple of things. Open access can be two or three different apps on the same device, or open access can be true open access, which is an operating system which manages information from a carrier and then provides the same user interface and user experience for the operator in store and a series of messages to uh, to consumers which are sort of conformed to the Pudo experience. So I think at the moment we're seeing a bit of a hybrid of those two. There are some proper uh, um, examples of uh, open access happening, and then there are some of these sort of hybrids, which is one location. I think Paypoint operate this way, and that's no disrespect to Paypoint. That's how they're operating using their technology. They'll have the DPD app and maybe the Amazon Hub app operating on the Paypoint terminal in a store, and those two things operating side by side. So it's it's a location being open access, but not the technology. Now, Nadia, um, hello, Nadia from Spectos and Kesey has just made the comment that in Germany, there's no difference in cost for home delivery versus Pudo delivery. 
So there we go. An interesting UK. perspective from the ground there in Germany. Well, folks, we might move on to the next slide because otherwise we might get a little bit bogged down here. I know there's been a couple of questions in the chat looking at this sort of a breakup. So, Mike, do you want to just start taking us through what this slide means? Yeah, so, so this is the culmination of a kind of a relatively intense period of, of nine months of, of research. Um, we actually wanted to produce this in a report with Accenture, but then Brody, who you're working with, left to join Escher. So uh, they were rival. So we couldn't do that. Um, hi, Brody, if you're on. Um, uh, but basically what this is, is um, it's really difficult to find the percentage of, of B2C e-commerce parcels which are delivered to home versus out of home. Um, and so what what we did was we started using publicly available data, insight from the carriers we are working with, consumer research, which we which we did a load of, and then expert interviews. So we, we consulted about three experts in each of the market on a kind of Chatham House rules basis to ask them, you know, what is the percentage of parcels that are to home versus out of home? Because we wanted to know where markets sit. You know, and I think the results are pretty like, they're fascinating to people who are geeks in this space, like the three of us, and hopefully some of you guys listening, in, the, in that you've got like, you know, 1% of parcels going to out of home in Japan and India, and 90% going out of home in Finland. So the Nordics being the other end of the, of the, of the kind of scale. And I think, you know, our perspective, having thought about this and then work with these experts on this is kind of think there's a there's a there's a position or a prediction that we want to make, which is we believe that every market in the world will work towards 40 percent of parcels being delivered out of home. Um, and so if that's the case, you can see there's a huge room for growth in markets like Japan, Turkey, USA and those markets as they move towards us. And actually, we believe we'll see a retraction in home in out of home delivery in some of those scandinavian markets and you know and, and israel as uh, you know and i think some of the pressures that you you hear from the nordic carriers is they're under pressure to have better home delivery options because out of home is so good so it's probably a, a couple of points i would make in in making that prediction so wh why do we feel comfortable making the prediction um firstly i think the the market trends support this so we're seeing a, as marek's alluded to a huge growth in out of home networks and the utilization of them so market trends are supporting a, a move towards, for most markets, this kind of greater use of out of home. Secondly, we work with carriers, the dollar works with the likes of Yamato and Australia Post, where they are setting strategic objectives for their business in terms of how many parcels they want to deliver to out of home. And so when carriers start setting that as a strategic objective for their business, you know this is very real and it's a metric they start to measure. But I think you know, the most fundamental reason that we believe this is 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 a kind of sensible prediction to make is probably tying back to some of the points I was making earlier. E-commerce has been growing at 10 or 15% for the last 15 or 20 years. It's in mega growth phase. No one, you know, ASOS and Amazon and those guys aren't valued on profitability, they're valued on revenue growth and that's what people care about. As that market matures and we get to a more stable part of the e-commerce market, markets will have to become more efficient and people will look towards profitability. And if you can deliver 10 items to one location rather than one item to 10 lo uh, one item individually to 10 different locations, there is a fundamental consolidation benefit that is being realized. And that benefit is at the moment the, the markets are operating inefficiently. So your the, the, the question or the comment in the in the chat box in Germany, home delivery and, and Pudo are the same. In in the UK, a carrier like Hermes you know, or whoever would charge ASOS £2.50 or £3 for 10 home deliveries or 10 deliveries to one location. It's not rocket science. That 10 deliveries to one pickup point is making them a shed load of money or is much more cost efficient to them. So as markets mature and they become more efficient, you will see an increased use of Pudo. Out of home. If, if I can just jump in, Mike knows I'm going to do this. So I, where I agree with the left part of it, which is that, yes, Pudos and lockers are going to grow an awful lot. Uh, my, my, I, I have a little bit more optimism on the markets, which already have a lot of Pudos and lockers, for the following reason. I think there's a short-term COVID effect, which means more people are uh, in, sort of willing to have and want home delivery. But I think purely from a capacity perspective, and capacity is the biggest single issue we face, 
uh, particularly in some of these Nordic markets with the geography they've got. I think if we have ever better out of home delivery, and what I mean by better is I call it slipper distance, so that the, the poodle or the locker is so close to your home that it's actually almost like a home delivery. I think that we're going to keep figures relatively close to that. And if I'm if I'm right, then uh, it's a good bottle of, uh, of uh, whiskey. If I'm wrong, it's a great bottle of vodka for you. The lights have actually gone off in the office. Sorry. Um, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I mean, look, we, we will see. We're just going to have to see how, how that how that world plays out. You know, I, I think there's definitely an urban, there's an urban rural split here to be factored in. There's a, there's a grocery versus non-grocery split to be factored in here. But yeah, I mean, this is definitely making some generalizations, but we certainly see this as being a, you know, a, a way the markets will move. Now, we can just turn to some of the questions. We've had about three people ask the same question. So let me see if I can bring this question up. It's a, a, here's from Karen. Uh, it says, how is Corona Im impacting the boost of Pudo? While most people work at home, this will, remi will, this remain, well, this will probably remain a trend for the future. Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, Mike or Marek, who would like to lead off on this one? So, so uh, I mean... Uh, in the UK and in our experience, so a Nordic carrier told me last week that um, Pudo had driven the use of out of home from 75% in 2019 to 64% in 2020. So they've had a reduction in out of home delivery as a result of um, as a result of COVID because more people are home. I think that's probably the same in the UK, if not if not more like a, a stronger move because the the convenience stores have been shut. So the majority of the Pudo networks in the UK are convenience stores or the like, and those are non-essential retail, and therefore have been have been closed. Locker usage in the UK has grown dramatically. You know, Amazon and and Impost have, have been a beneficiary of this. I guess I'm probably less. I think the the behaviour change we've we've seen during COVID. I think it, you know it, we change quickly into the custom of working from home and adopting working from home practices. I have a feeling that we'll change back relatively quickly too. You know, it might not happen this year, but in 2022, three, four, it, people won't forget. But there will be a, there will be a pretty much you know, 80, 90 percent of the workplace will be back to the way they did previously. I, th I think that there, there are two effects. There's one long term effect, which is what does COVID mean? And in my opinion, what it means is you're going to have a large group of people who are not buying online, who have decided, hey, this is actually pretty cool because they've been forced to do so. Generally, more conservative, slightly older people who wouldn't really normally have even thought about clicking to buy. Uh, and I think a lot of those people, uh, my parents-in-law included, uh, are going to be loyal e-commerce shoppers because it's just great when someone delivers uh, the heavy sort of uh, dog food or something else. Uh, the other group, I think, are people who were buying online, but were buying different things. They've started buying food products, uh, health and medical products. And again, they've realized, hey, this is pretty good. So I think there's going to be a permanent shift. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how much of that. I don't know, Mike, what, what you've seen. I've, I've seen about 30 percent is, is a consensus opinion. 30 percent of that change will be there for good. And then... From my perspective, the the issue of locker, pudo, uh, et cetera, versus to door, it's it's a it's difficult to say during COVID for the reasons Mike mentioned. Uh, in Czech Republic as well, I heard a lot of pudos were closed. In Poland, actually, ironically, most of the convenience stores were kept open and open seven days a week, which others were not. So we had a different effect. So I think it's going to be very much based on specific local circumstances. But when COVID goes and i hope it's soon i think we are going to find that there will be a permanent shift towards out of home um will there be you know perhaps in finland a small decrease from the 90 percent maybe but i don't think it's going to be much mike maddock we might move on to our general discussion in a moment but i also think it's time for us to get everybody involved in a poll so i've got a poll here which is on the Pudo hold time. How long should parcels be stored at a Pudo before they are returned to sender? Now, I'm very interested in this one. All right. So, play oh, everybody's voting already. So, go. Whilst, whilst people are voting, I'll just voting. Make one comment. We've spoken to several operators, and it's incredible that the, the difference of opinion on what's right is it's, it's not a question of, you know, hours or days, but it's several days. 
So, you know, we get extremes from, I think the most extreme I've ever seen anywhere was 14 days. I don't know if you've seen anything longer, Mike. Um, and the yeah, I've seen 10. Day. But, but that, that's an interesting point in terms of locker APMs versus PUDOs as well. You know, it, it really matters in a locker. And a carrier owns a locker. So typically a carrier owns a locker and therefore they, they fundamentally care about utilization, dwell, fill rates, those types of things. And and the dwell time is essential. You know, there's that classic story about the guys from Parcel Motel in Ireland where you pay for an extra night's stay at the Parcel Motel, uh, where you know you've got two days dwell, but then it's a euro every day. And I thought that was a great model. And it was actually a profitable standalone parcel locker model i think the interesting thing is on parcel shops you don't have that worry as much you know effectively the the parcel shop relationship is a partnership but they're outside of your world you don't need to worry too much about the dwell time because it's it's almost their problem yeah and they don't um, seem I don't, to, I don't know where to, to begin with all that I don't, I don't know where to begin. right let's let's remember here we've got to focus on the customer all right what does the customer want the customer wants their delivery. So we have to focus on ways to encourage the customer to collect as quickly as possible. So that's the first thing. Let's focus on the systems, whether it's a software system, whether it's automated emails to the customer to get the customer into the PUDO point, whether it's a post office, it's a third party operated PUDO to collect that parcel. Because you need to get the parcels out of the PUDO point, whether it's a PUDO or a parcel lock, it doesn't matter. You need to get them out because you don't want to have a capacity issue. I know that we say that they're flexible and they're, 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 more, they're more flexible. They, PUDO points are more flexible than a locker, but they still have capacity. And I can tell you oh, from definitely. personal experience in Australia, we've seen many post offices reach capacity and just say, that's it, we're full. And they can only take parcels two days a week. I, now, I, I'm you need not, to I'm then reimagine your not... own business model to make to inside inside the post office at that point. So how do we make sure we've got enough storage space in the post office to deal with the volumes that we're getting? How can we make sure that people come to collect their parcels quickly rather than waiting till a Saturday morning to collect them? Then all you do on a Saturday morning is give out parcels. So there's a lot of moving parts in there. So um, I don't think you can just an, an, a Pudo network operator or a pass. A, I'll get it in a second, everyone. A Pudo network operator or a post office network operator can't just think that it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters to the customers. It matters to the business owners who are looking after those parcels because they want to make sure they can manage them. Let's have a look. Let's just cut short my preaching now because otherwise I'll go on I don't get a chance to respond. I can't believe you. you. You want to respond to that, do you, Mike? I, I, was make, I, wasn't, I wasn't making it. I think I was trying to make a more conceptual point about the, the lockers are a kind of there. There's an overhead to that locker that you have to empty, whereas there isn't they may be necessarily the same definite point around the lockers. I completely agree that you can't just treat your your Pudo network like a kind of partner. You can deal with the problem because that many it falls over. Um, but I was just making a kind of, you know, it, 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 it's a pretty binary. If you can't put a parcel in a locker, you can't use that locker. Whereas there's a little bit more flexibility with a, maybe the Pudo network. Let's have a look at the poll Matt, here because there's some really the interesting spray. answers in the poll. Go on, Matic. <laughs> All right. I can't see the poll, so tell what, what the answers. I'm really interested. I'm going I'm to tell you what the poll is. Well, look, they're being shown now on the screen, so everybody can see oh, the wow. results. So you can see the results there. Interesting, isn't it? This is really interesting. So. just, just um, I can jump into the tray, though, on, on the point we made before. The reality is with PUDOs, there is a cost. The cost may not be visible. And keeping several tens or even hundreds in some cases, the, the, the record I think was 600 parcels in, in a very large PUDO, um, does have a cost associated to it. So I think it's a question of, 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 of finding a good compromise. I really like what I see here because actually what I've seen in most networks is you tend to have, as Mike said, a short period for lockers, which tends to be even shorter at peak, which is usually two days, sometimes in, in Poland, I think it's less for impost now. And then you have around, around about five days for PUDOs. And that's actually where we're at, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I think that replicates kind of, you know, we've seen, the, the other thing about the consumer piece, uh, Ian, is, uh, what I should, I'm sort of, I've got to feel quite strongly about it, is I think consumers pick stuff up quickly. That One of the things that we've talked about in PUDO is actually, 
customers use them and, and they love the kind of, oh, it's there, it's, I can get it when I want to get it. It's quite exciting. It's like the you have control over that delivery when it goes into the location. You can choose when you want to pick it up. And so I think we saw, in we've seen in our UK network, with fast fashion, like 80% of stuff gets picked up same day. So you do mm -hmm. get quite a big fast pickup rate of those things because customers want to get their hands on They'll make a dedicated trip or they'll find a way on their way home to go and pick that stuff up. But I, I completely agree with Marek's point around kind of the split between lockers and pudos. You have a shorter time period in, in lockers. You have a longer time period in, in pudos. You start to see the charging of increments. I think Hivebox did something where after 12 hours, they started charging consumers increments uh, of, of dwell time in the parcel locker in China to really drive the behavior. It's, it's exactly the model in Poland as well. You're charged, uh, you have a minimum amount of time and then you can extend, but you pay. Um, I mean, Hivebox is an interesting one, and that could be one for a future webinar because China, the prices that are charged mean that you've got these amazing networks of, you know, several hundred thousand machines that actually aren't making a great deal of money. So that would be a really good one for a future uh, webinar. Ian, all now, over to you. Joshua in the chat has made the same point I was about to make. Uh, we actually, he's asked a question, but it's, it's really it's a question. The answer to the question is the question itself. Does access to Pudo points in terms of opening times also have an effect on collections and i would say most likely yes if you've got a, a pudo point or a post office that's open until 7 p.m which means that people who are working are able to collect after hours then yeah you're going to get get those parcels into the customer's hands quicker mike do you have any comments on that i agree completely Ian. <sighs> write it down everybody 309 p.m I'll just add that if I can. The beauty of both Pudos and Lockers is it makes a B2C delivery become like a B2B because it's a fixed location. You don't have to try and find the address because it's it's a it's a business type address. You don't have the risk that it's on the 30th floor of a block of flats and the lift isn't working and that the intercom is not working. So you've got problems getting in. So, you know, it makes it so much easier. It's so much more efficient. Now, I think it's time for us to get to our discussion about the secrets to Pudo success because we're getting so many questions coming in. And I think we might be able to answer a lot of the questions by kicking off our discussion. Um, so why don't I just move us forward to the next slide? What is the most important factor in driving Pudo success? And I know that we have we've sort of intimated a few of these here, but Mike, Perhaps you'd just like to kick things off with what you think is the most important factor, or maybe one or two of the most important factors in driving Pudo success. Sure. Um, so as a salesperson, I should probably say technology, but <laughs> given, <laughs> given that's what we sell, but that's not what I'm going to say. I, I, so for me, this can, the most important thing is, is alignment. And so what's alignment? Alignment, th there are four like stakeholders in the, in the Pudo ecosystem. There is the, the merchant, the parcel carrier, the Pudo network owner, and the consumer. And the closer those parties are, and the more aligned they are, the more successful a Pudo network will be. So if those four parties are dealing on their own and kind of operating with their own interests, you know, it, it, an example, the UK, ASOS want this, Carrier wants this, Impost as an independent locker network wants this, and the consumer wants this. If they're not operating collaboratively, you don't get the benefits and you don't get the adoption. If by contrast, those parties are very well aligned, then you do get huge adoption. So you can look at the markets like France or Poland or, or the Nordics where the, the carrier is offering a discount to the merchant and the merchant is sometimes sharing that discount with the consumer uh, and they're driving better foot traffic into the Pudo network owner. And all of a sudden, those four parties are getting something out of the equation. Where there's no alignment, you still start to struggle. And if you think about you know, what I was saying earlier about Amazon Hub. Amazon Hub, I've got 5,000 lockers and let's say 10,000 Pudos in the UK. Amazon Hub are pushing Pudos so aggressively because they don't make any more money for any of their deliveries. Most people are prime customers. So that it's all it's all cost, it's all, it's all just cost to them. So if they can drive customers into using Pudos or lockers, they are the merchant, the carrier, and the Pudo network owner, and the world's most customer-centric company, so they say. You know, that's a super aligned Pudo business that has huge success. And Marek put something on LinkedIn at the weekend. They promote it on emails. They recently did a five pound off offer to consumers to use Amazon Hub networks because when they know that when that Amazon Hub location goes into the delivery, you know, the delivery um, field for that customer, it stays there and they will continue to use it. So I think that's like kind of a, 
a longish answer, but it comes down to making sure that the four parties in the Pudo ecosystem are completely aligned. I'll just add one thing to what Mike said, because he's absolutely right. Smart e-commerce players, and Amazon is a perfect example, also understand that the beauty of out of home is you get very, very high first time delivery, almost 100%. And the worst thing for an e-commerce player is a failed delivery, a failed sale and a possible return. But, but moving on, I, I think, Mike, you're going to be surprised. I'm going to agree with you because I think, you know, strategically, those are the, the, the fundamental things that have to be there. But I'm going to talk about very practical things, which are the IT, the tech. If you don't have, Ian knows what I'm going to say, the three letters, IDM, Interactive Delivery Management, working really well, it cannot work. So that's a practical thing. Let's say you've got the guys and girls working together, but you need the tech which is a secret source that holds it together and makes it work. So I think that's one thing. The second thing, you need networks that are proximate because however wonderful you are, however perfect everything else is, if you have uh, two kilometers to go to get to your nearest locker or Pudo, it isn't going to fly. So I think that's the second sort of part of the secret source that is fundamental. And then I think the third one is you need the parcels themselves. And that comes, I think, to Mike's point a bit. You need a big e-commerce player. And what I've realized, we've set up two really big networks from scratch, and both of our clients were dominant e-commerce players. And it's their parcels that made it work. So um, actually, I'm going to surprise you, Mike, and agree with everything you said. I think it's I just added some of the, let's say, mechanics to, to the part you mentioned. Yeah, the, the proximity points bang on, and, and and I think that there's definitely examples of of uh, networks that have not worked because they don't have enough proximity to enough people. I think you mentioned slipper distance earlier. The guys at B Post talk about slipper, sneaker, snack, and and stop. So the four S's: slipper distance, snacking distance, sneaker, going for a run, or or stopping somewhere on your way. And I quite like that as a kind of as a theme for what was proximity, because proximity isn't just distance from home. Proximity is actually really a proxy for convenience. So I think that's bang on. And the, the other point you make about parcel volumes, I think that's also really true. So what a what do a FedEx do? What do a what do a carrier like um, yeah, across Europe? FedEx are a huge global carrier, massive in the US, got great dominance. But what do they do in in Italy? Or what are the you know where those guys don't necessarily have enough volume in themselves to justify a standalone network? And I think one of the things that we will see in the coming years is partnerships and open access networks between those good businesses, which are like, okay, I have got X many parcels in that market. I may have five percent market share, but you've got. 12% and you've got 17% between us. We're not really competing for the same volume because you're doing domestic and I'm doing international cross-border and high, but but we'll, we'll use a network collaboratively. So I think you can establish proximity and you can establish volume uh, in, in collaborative ways. I'm surprised no is real. Well, you've mentioned their network density to an extent. Um, Maddox, you've got a magic figure. Does it work for Pudos as well as lockers when it comes to yeah, well, density? It's, it's for in general so it's, I, I call it the, the I call it the matriculation rule it's not something that will guarantee a network will be successful but if you have less it guarantees based on everything we've seen that you will fail so less than one per ten thousand you will fail it's not the optimal because our friends at uh, Postnoria have done some really good research recently I think it, it ended up that 350 meters is the optimal slipper distance in a town but but the one per ten thousand is our sort of matriculation rule Right, it's time now for me to go off on a rant, I think. Um, th those of you who don't know, I have a big background in the post office. And um, certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen really big growth in parcels being handled in post offices in Australia. And so obviously in the case of Australia Post, it already has the network. And it'll be the same for every other postal operator. There is a network, it can be augmented by additional PUDO points, especially if you've got gaps or extra volume that you need to somehow deal with, in particular, say, in suburban areas, where you've got a lot of residential B2C deliveries, which are, as Matt outlined before, you know, they're the expensive ones compared to, say, a B2B delivery. So um, I mentioned earlier about having secure storage at the post office. That's a practical aspect of it because the customer, when they go into the PUDO point or the post office, they do not want to see their parcel sitting on the floor in the public space. Now, that's one thing. Um, the customer doesn't want to wait in a queue for a long time to collect their parcel. 
So there's a second thing. Uh, and then the, um, the person who's operating the PUDO, whether it's a PUDO or a privately owned post office, whatever it is, they want to make sure they're getting enough money out of it to make it worthwhile. Now, I know that someone's about to say something about the trade off between that and foot traffic, but um, that is a clear thing. It is a reason we, Mark, Mark just mentioned, if you don't get to a certain density, you will almost certainly fail. Well, similarly, if you don't get these things right at a practical level, you will probably fail. It's as simple as that. And I've seen examples from a number of operators around the world where they have excessive amounts of churn of their third party PUDO operators because of things like bad customer service um, or the PUDO operator saying, oh, I'm not getting enough ma money out of it. It's not worth my while. So yeah. there we go. I'm, I'll say that just to stimulate a bit of discussion. I'm sure that the chat's about to go crazy on that as well. So Mike, Mark, do you want to make any comments on my entirely reasonable and 100% correct remarks? <laughs> No, you, I mean, so uh, to generalize what you said, and like, it's the customer experience in the Pudo. So if you have a bad customer experience, uh, and that could be because there's a queue, because the parcels are left in a terrible state, because it doesn't look like anyone's caring for it, that's, I completely agree with you. That is going to make a network fail very, very quickly. And there's been networks that have kind of risen very quickly, not being able to cope with the customer experience. And therefore, you know, one of the hardest things that we've had and found both as a network operator in the UK and as a part of a technology provider globally is changing behavior. So customers just do the same thing over and over and over again. So to get them to change behavior, to do something different, you have to hit them with lots of different touch points and you have to hit them regularly. And eventually they do change. If when they do change from home delivery to Pudo, that experience is poor and you waste that experience by making it, you know, by making it, as you described, big queue, parcel left, uncared for, you know, very visible in a, in a store, which you, know, you don't associate with the brand you're buying from or the carrier you're shipping through. I completely agree. You've got, you've got it completely wrong. If you can make it digital and you can run a network, either in a post office, which is perfectly set up for this, subject to managing queues and maybe thinking about the opening hours or in a PUDO where you instill certain standards on that network to make sure they operate under those standards and you're you're providing the feedback loop from customers to make sure you're tracking the performance of individual locations then I think you can manage it but it's certainly a really really important thing to watch it will drive adoption or massively inhibit adoption if you get it wrong just have to jump in here quickly and you'll be surprised here and i i completely agree as well the only thing i'll say what, what surprises <gasps> 3 19 p.m there we go it's 309 for mike 319 for maddock it's happened everybody you've seen them both agree with me today i have a few hundred witnesses as well thank you right please go on maddock what, what's a but what surprises me is how few networks do a sort of an uber type star rating after you pick up because that's a great way to immediately get feedback which PUDO is not performing, which locker is not working as it should. And it, 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 I find it amazing because it's the best way that the customer can immediately give you feedback. So guys and girls, if you've got a network and you don't have that, it's one of the first things that when we're advising someone, we say do this because it gives you a free way rather than calling people, trying to get data later, which is difficult, get that information straight away and avoid all of the things that Ian mentioned. We've been uh, so Marek, we've been doing that since 2016. I couldn't agree more. It's not just important for the carrier; it's important for the carrier's relationship with the merchant. Merchants in in many of the markets, which are low levels of PUDO adoption, are distrusting. The guy who runs logistics, the guy who runs e-com experience in X fast fashion company goes, "Why do I need PUDO?" If you can say to them, look at the star rating, look at the performance, look at the feedback you're getting from these these things, and then you know what? Actually, why don't you go into your own system and look at um, customer satisfaction, look at order frequency, look at order value, look at return rate, look at lifetime value of customers if they use PUDO. I've got a few minutes left, so I can't get my rant on this, but we did some analysis with the leading fast fashion retailer in the UK. Their PUDO customers were higher value than their home delivery customers. So they were buying more, they were buying more frequently, and they were bigger basket value. Like, because there's something which is again something to a separate separate conversation about the kind of psychology of professional online shoppers they get loads of stuff online they want it delivered to a place where they can pick it up when they want to pick it up on their terms and they can potentially return it through the same location and that's, that's a really convenient and that's it. it's, it's the return mike and yep. i think i think this is a subject for a whole webinar in its own right 
So there we go. Returns also important because it's not just pick up, it's also drop off. Uh, Mike, Maddock, we've got about 10 minutes left and we've got loads of questions that have come through on the Q&A and in the chat. So if you, if you don't mind, I think we might try and answer some of the questions since it all fits in nicely to this idea of what are the ideal ways to set up a network. Um, one of it is the environment. So we've got here, it's been asked by an anonymous attendee. Hello, anonymous attendee. Thank you for joining us today. Do you have, well, it's really asking, what's the impact of PUDO delivery on emissions? Uh, and what's the risk of the customer going to the PUDO point? It's the same for a locker by car and therefore annulling any potential emissions benefit, shall we say? So, um, go, Marek. Okay, um, so there's no, there's no, there's no universal truth here, right? No one's produced empirical data on this, so it is conjecture. Um, uh, but there are lots of reports who have made a made a position, and they and they come from both sides. Some say home delivery is more um, more carbon efficient because that customer is then not driving to a retail high street to buy it in the store, and they're not driving to a pickup point. Uh, you know, I think the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Actually, oh, so I have a different view. I think Pudo is significantly more carbon beneficial, carbon efficient, because I, my, you know, I live in London. Uh, in London, London was responsible for 25% of e-commerce in the UK, Greater London. In that in that community in London, you know, there is a huge use of Pudo networks, and there is a huge usage of public transport and foot. Most of the most of the Pudo networks are in slipper or sneaker distance, using the BPO's terms. You know, your people are walking to those locations. So it kind of you know, and if you're doing that, and the carrier is doing one delivery of ten items to that location, and eight out of the ten people are walking there, there is a huge carbon efficiency. The other thing I think that needs to kind of be factored into that whole debate is which is happening loads. Like consumers really care about sustainability, rightly so, and retailers are catching on to this and merchants are following. But you've also got cities becoming increasingly difficult to drive in. So London, as again, as an example, you know, the, the delivery, the driving speeds in London are coming right down. The usage of cycle lanes and other forms of traffic, non-driving access in, in London is, is growing hugely there's 300 percent more cycle journeys in london this year than there was last year i think all of that kind of comes together to to drive up a usage of pudo versus that kind of that van that traditional van going to to home well, maybe i'm going to be closer Matt. to the to the to the point on um on real ecological benefits that there is some data was it done with the best scientific methodology i don't know but there are two pieces of data i've seen an old piece of data I can't remember, it was, a, it was an academic uh, work around about four or five years ago in Poland, where it showed something that actually is very similar to what, what we've seen recently, that it's about one third of the carbon footprint for a locker in an urban area. Uh, recent data, uh, if you read the, the Impulse Prospectus, it says something pretty similar. And I think it says that on a rural route, it's even more, it could be only 10% of the carbon footprint. What I would say is if you really do have the lockers or pudos so close that it's it's slipper distance, you're not making a special trip, point one. And if it's at the end of your road, you'll do it when you're, if you do drive, you'll do it when you're going somewhere. And the second point, which I think Mike is similar to what, what you made is, um, if it's in your convenience store where you're gonna go anyway, or at your local petrol station, then the chances are it will be on your way. So my view is because of the huge benefit in efficiency and it's not just the fact that you know we're talking about delivering 50 60 70 parcels per stop compared for certainly for a locker compared to 1.2 to a home address but we're also talking about the fact that you have easy access easy parking uh, you don't have to traipse up 30 flights of stairs so for all those reasons i believe that even if you can queer it a bit the the echo footprint is much much better for out of home yeah. Right now, um, we've got a few more questions. We'll try and get through in the time we have remaining. Catherine DeBartz, Catherine, I don't quite understand your question. Can you just clarify what you mean by social pudo? Do you mean like where it's picking up from someone's house? Just clarify, because it sounds like an interesting question. So I'll go to another question while you're clarifying that, Catherine. Thanks. Um, Rob Rob Leek says, same day delivery to pudos or lockers. Is this the logical next step? Is there a market for it? Any quick comments on that? Marek, you're shaking. You're nodding your head vigorously for you. So what already, do you say? It's already happening. It's already happening in Poland. Um, it's, it's early days. 
but but I, I don't know if you guys have seen this data, but quite a quite a lot of data is suggesting that over the next four or five years, same day is going to move from being almost nowhere under five percent to maybe being twenty, maybe even twenty five percent of all deliveries generated by or, or, or catalyzed by by Amazon and people like Amazon. So given that, I think it will happen. There are being tests. Is it easy? No. What I love about it, I don't know, Mike, what your take is, but this link between crowdsource uh, drivers able to pick up, I think that's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, so so same day to Pudo, I think it's the only way same day can really work at scale, unless you're Amazon maybe. So, so if someone like so Nike in London wants to do same day delivery, um, you know, they can deliver to 500 locations or, or nine million households. You, know, it, you can see how 500 locations, gyms or, or some sort of Nike branded pickup points could really make same day at scale. And there's certain products. Nike is a, is a sort of retailer that really has a same day product. There are others who, who may be less so. So I think same day to Pudo or lockers could definitely work. Um, could definitely be a way of achieving. I, d I don't still don't think same day will be uh, a significant part of the e-commerce delivery landscape in, in the next few years. I think it's going to be interesting to see how same day calculates its environmental impact because if it's hyper local delivery, that same day, that's one thing. I mean, how far is that urgent package uh, traveling and doesn't need to be that urgent that it has a bigger environmental impact compared to say an overnight or a two-day delivery. So something for us to ponder there. Katrin has got back to us. Thank you, Katrin from Debats. Katrin, I interviewed Katrin on the uh, Postal Hub podcast a couple of months ago. Very interesting discussion. You should go and check it out. Um, social Pudo, and that is a private person acting as a Pudo, which is like a almost a delivery to neighbour. And we know, Matic, there are a couple of schemes. There's one in Singapore called Park and Parcel. There's one in Germany, which has a name. If I mispronounce it, it sounds like a very rude word, but I think it's Fox in German. Um, the, um, so, well, Mike, I might throw to you first of all. I mean, it, does a platform like Doddle have the capacity to expand to those sorts of things? Uh, can you see that being part of the future in the time that we have left here? Um, I don't think we have a huge amount of time left, but um, uh, so Doddle, Doddle no. did this. We did this in 2016. We, it was called Doddle Neighbor. We tried very hard for about a year to make this work. Uh, and we had some amazing results from a kind of customer re reaction perspective and an adoption perspective. But the scaling of it, you, you encounter loads more problems in a house than you do in, in a store. So you talked earlier about the experience, making sure the experience is good. That the experience in in a convenience store and the challenges you may have with storage and access and opening hours and you know whatever public liability insurance are exacerbated in a home. You got to get in there. You got to get past the dog. The person's got to be in to receive the parcels. You got to make sure they're not there. You got to enable trust. And so there are there are examples of this working. I think there are markets where the kind of the cultural fabric of the economy could make you work. The Nordics, socially progressive, you know, Benelux maybe as well. Uh, again, uh, probably in the, in the camp of it not being a huge part of the delivery landscape in the next few years. We, our time is basically up. So, okay. <laughs> and there's still loads of questions and comments, co comments coming in. Uh, perhaps I'll just bring up the last slide, which has our contact details on it. Um, so if you want to continue the conversation with any of us, in particular with Mike, Mike, do you want to just uh, quickly, I mean, people obviously have a bit of an idea about Doddle. Do you want to just quick have, give people a quick 30 second idea of what you do at Doddle and how you can help and how people should contact you? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we license technology to parcel carriers um, that helps them achieve their goals in out of home delivery and returns. So we're working with the likes of Australia Post, Yamato, USPS on both their out of home delivery and return strategy, both both technology, but also a lot of the stuff that we talk about today. How, what does the strategy look like? Um, so if anyone wants to, to find out more, definitely, please feel free to drop me a line. So email addresses are over there. I think I'm pointing out. Yes, there we go. So or down there. Um, do contact uh, Matt, Mike if you want to find out more about Doddle. And if you want, if you have more questions, I can see that oh, questions are still coming in. The comments are still coming in. Email us, right? Uh, e email us. Let us know um, what you think. Uh, ask us questions, and maybe we could run a session. Matt, Matic and I could run a session dedicated for you. Um, those of you who want to relive this again, it, it will be available on YouTube very soon. Uh, so. 
I think it's time now to say thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you, Marek. Any final words before we wrap up, Marek, very briefly? I think it's been real fun. Uh, I love the engagement and hoping that this is the beginning of a long series of uh, webinars on this subject. And thanks again to Mike and everyone at Doddle for supporting this event. Certainly has created a lot of discussion in the chat. And if there's enough demand, we might do another one. There'll be a short three question survey when you close Zoom. So please do complete that survey on today's session. Would really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for sticking around to the end. And we look for, oh, we have to wave goodbye. I think that's what everybody does these, now these days, end of Zoom events. So bye bye, everybody. <laughs> thanks, Matic. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>